goblins. Everybody's favourite mischievous, big-nosed, greedy, gold-hoarding creatures. Okay, so maybe not everybody's favourite set of creatures, but I like them, and that's why they finally get a video. That, and it's almost impossible to avoid them in modern fantasy, because just like filthy sewer rats, they are absolutely everywhere. In books, in movies, and in games. If there is gold or treasure, then there is probably an ugly little green man telling you that time is money, friend. In this video we'll take a look at their various origins across Europe, the different types of goblins, and how they're used in today's works of fiction. Goblins have existed all around the world for hundreds of years, going by many different names across Europe that all sounded very similar to the term that we use today, but differed in the way that it was spelt. The Latin gobelinus and the Greek gobelus are probably the furthest away from the word goblin, which became the accepted English term sometime in the 14th century. This in itself has an Anglo-Norman influence deriving from the old French word gobelin. The term itself was fairly broad, but it often referred to small, grotesque, mischievous creatures with a desire for gold, treasure, or anything shiny, which to some may just sound like their younger sibling. If one was to come between them and their gold, it would turn this behaviour from impish to outright malicious. One of the most common and well-known types of goblin is the Hobgoblin, and no, we're not talking about the Spider-Man villain. Although it's pretty easy to understand why William Defoe was cast as the Green Goblin, because he does have that very creepy goblin, give me your gold or I'll eat your children kind of face. Anyway. Hobgoblins appear in both English and Scottish folklore, but they aren't exactly the type of goblins that we're used to seeing today. The word hob at times was used to describe an elf, and hobgoblins were seen as fairy spirits associated with the hearth or the home, a relative to the brownie, only a bit more unpredictable. Similar to brownies, hobgoblins are found in human dwellings. So taking what their name could mean into account, they are kind of house elf goblins, which does sound a lot like Dobby, and we know J.K. Rowling was heavily influenced by British and European folklore. In the case of Dobby and the house elves of Harry Potter, they are somewhat of a mix between hobgoblins and brownies. In terms of appearance, hobgoblins are pretty much what we described earlier. Small, hairy little men that come out during the evening to do chores around the house when the family fall asleep. Very similar to the Slavic Domovoi, just not as hairy. The only thing they ask for in return is food. Well, they don't really ask, they just take it as compensation for their service. Now I know what some of you may be thinking. Where can I find one of these hairy little men to do chores for me while I laze about in bed? And the answer is nowhere. Do your own chores, you lazy little goblins. The main difference between hobgoblins and brownies is that brownies are quite mild-tempered, peaceful creatures, whereas hobgoblins are much more... douchebaggy. They have a pretty short temper, and they love to play tricks on the family they live with. Some were even said to be able to shapeshift, with Shakespeare's character Puck from A Midsummer's Night Dream being a pretty good example of a shapeshifting jester-like hobgoblin who is more of a troublemaker than outright evil or dangerous. The story of Robin Roundcap is one that highlights this almost bipolar nature of some hobgoblins. He was said to haunt Spordington Hall in East Yorkshire. Roundcap would help the locals husk corn when he felt like being helpful, but when he wanted to be a menace he'd mix and hide the corn. He'd kick over cans of milk and generally just make life more difficult. Those living in Spaldington Hall managed to trap him in a well, and with the assistance of the local clergymen and their prayers, they kept him trapped there for several years. Luckily, there is an easier way to get rid of unwanted hobgoblins that doesn't involve throwing them into a well and having a bunch of clergymen pray for you. Presenting a hobgoblin with a new piece of clothing is thought to banish them. Why this works is where most stories tend to differ. Some say that this gift will offend them, and I guess it is somewhat of an insult to their dress sense. Whereas others say that hobgoblins are very proud creatures who would rather leave your house than accept a gift. So the question of the day is, if a hobgoblin gets kicked out of its house and has nowhere to go, does that make them a hobo goblin? Looking back at Dobby and the house elves once more, it should now make a bit more sense why they're always in tattered clothing, and why presenting them with a new piece of clothing is a way of freeing them from their servitude. So I guess you now know where J.K. Rowling borrowed this particular idea from. 
In the work of Tolkien, hobgoblins were drastically different to say the very least. They were only mentioned once by Gandalf in The Hobbit, but he does say that it was a name given to orcs who were much larger than normal, which is pretty much the opposite to what we see in traditional folklore. Another very common type of goblin from Scottish and English folklore is known as the Red Cap, a malevolent and murderous creature who earned the name due to the cap he wore being red, because it was soaked in the blood of his victims. A very jolly and pleasant sounding individual, I know. This particular goblin had sharp teeth, skinny fingers with razor-like talons and eyes that would glow crimson. He had long, untamed hair and carried a pike staff with him, which we would assume was used to impale those he came across. Although it appears his preferred method of killing those who entered his lair or territory is by throwing huge stones at them and then dipping his hat in their blood. The Redcap could be chased away with the words of scripture, but brandishing a crucifix was a bit more of a permanent solution, causing him to vanish into flames, leaving behind a lone large tooth where he stood. There were several others that were similar to the Red Cap, inhabiting borders and castles, roaming the surrounding land with nefarious intent. Although Red Cap is often described as a singular entity, there are other stories that use the term, so it could easily be another subspecies of goblin. In Holland and various other European countries, there is a collection of fairy tales that feature goblins, which describe them as having a giant head, green eyes, and hoofed feet. They were so unpleasant to look at that they were ordered to live underground and only come out during the night, otherwise they would be turned into stone. These goblins spent most of their time resenting and playing tricks on humankind, and even sneaking around in the dead of night and snatching their children from their cradle, replacing them with their own. This hatred and disdain grew and grew until one night they ventured out and ignored the rising sun, turning them all into stone. Fairy tales featuring goblins were fairly common, especially in countries like France, England, Denmark, Holland and Germany. There is an argument to be made about Rumpelstiltskin possibly being a goblin because of his trickster-like behaviour and overall greedy nature. He is also depicted as wearing a cap that many goblins wore, and sometimes this cap is red. There is a chance this could be referring to the legend of the red cap. I'll leave a couple fairy tales featuring goblins on screen for those who would like to do some further reading. In Germanic folklore, their predominant goblin figure goes by the name of Earl King, which is thought to have come from the Danish meaning Elf King, who is described as the King of Fairies. Which does sound quite confusing, is he a goblin, an elf, or a fairy? Well, all these terms were fairly broad, and it was very common for the terms goblin, elf, and fairy to refer to the same set of creatures, normally small creatures that live underground and have some kind of magical property. Some of these magical powers may be similar to a modern day fairy, and some may be closer to an evil or demonic form of magic. There were also those capable of shapeshifting into small children, similar to a changeling, but that is a different creature. In Germany you also have the kobold, which is quite similar, but it's a creature I'd like to mention in its own video. In Spain and Portugal you have the Trascu, which are prankster-like spirits found in the forest, who dress in leaves to hide from humans. This type of goblin also appears in Celtic and Roman folklore, and is often described as a short man with a hole in his hands, who walks with a limp and a pointed red hat. He mostly sneaks into houses and moves their stuff around. When angered, he breaks things, scares cattle, and throws water all over the place. But similar to hobgoblins, if he's fed and treated well, then he'll help with chores around the house. The Trascu is quite a difficult goblin to get rid of, if you decide to move house, then they'll just follow. The only way to get rid of them is to challenge them to a task they cannot complete. Because of their enormous sense of pride, they will always accept this challenge. This challenge is often a very simple task, such as asking them to collect grains of rice or carry water in the palm of their hands because it will just fall straight through the hole. When they eventually realise they cannot finish the task given to them, they flee in shame. In Greece, you have a group of malevolent goblins known as the Kalikanzeros, which are also found around the southeast of Europe in countries like Serbia, Bulgaria, Albania, and Cyprus. 
These goblins spend most of the year underground, and only come out from December 25th till the 6th of January during the Christmas period, and their aim is to make our lives as hellish as possible. Whilst underground, these menaces soar away at the world tree, trying to, well, destroy the world for some sadistic reason. But just as the tree is about to fall, the Christmas period comes, and they turn their attentions above ground to humans. Once their time above ground has come to an end, they return to soaring away at the world tree, but in their absence the tree has regenerated, and this cycle continues endlessly. The Calicanzeros have no real set appearance, other than being very small and, as I'm sure you've guessed, very hairy. Sometimes they have various different animal parts, such as tails and hooves. Similar to some other goblins, they were also shown as having eyes that glow red, although their eyesight was exceptionally poor. They mostly fed on small creatures that they could smell, so during this Christmas period you'd want to keep your household pets close. As a result of this, during the Christmas period, people took several precautions to keep these disgusting little hairy men away from their homes. One of the most popular being leaving a colander outside the door. This works because they can't count past the number two because they believe merely saying that third number will immediately kill them. I'm not sure what kind of sense this makes, but it results in them sitting outside all night counting the holes in the colander, starting over once they get to that accursed number three. Eventually the sun rises and they're forced to run away and hide. Another method of protection is to leave one's fireplace burning all night so they can't use it as a way to enter without becoming charcoal. Some also burned old socks in their fireplace, believing that the smell would help to repel any unwanted Christmas guests. In modern fiction, the terms elf, fairy, and goblin refer to entirely different creatures, but that's not to say we don't get a large variety of different types of goblin. Quite often they're depicted as a horde of big dum-dums that just want to be a menace. In the Artemis Fowl book series, the goblins are considered very stupid by the other races, but they do have the ability to conjure fireballs. Now this combined with fireproof skin, a serious lack of brain cells, and the inability to get along with the other races means they are more than just a slight nuisance. The goblins in Harry Potter are slightly different in terms of them being sly and calculated, but they still have that stereotypical GIVE ME ALL YOUR GOLD vibe to them. I mean, a bunch of them work in Gringotts Bank counting gold all day, which does seem like a goblin's dream job until someone actually withdraws their money and you have to give them the gold. They also have a long history of fighting for acceptance from the wizarding world who saw them as vastly inferior, but that is another story. Now, as we mentioned earlier in the work of Tolkien, goblins and orcs are essentially the same species, with orcs even being considered a type of goblin. Normal goblins were very small, whereas hobgoblins were much larger, and orcs were somewhere in between. In the Hobbit movies, both Azog and the Great Goblin, that big fat dude in the cave with like 12 chins, are both considered to be goblins. But they are noticeably bigger than the rest, so I'm not sure if that makes them hobgoblins or not. With that said, there is a pretty clear distinction between the two. Azog and the Goblins of the Misty Mountains have a much paler complexion and are closer to humans in stature whereas the goblins found in the mines of Moria are your typical angry little green men with bulbous eyes and a horde or tribal mentality. It is worth mentioning that orcs and goblins are very tribal creatures in general. The actual colour of a goblin can range anywhere from green to red and even yellow in some cases, but most people, myself included, will think of the colour green when goblins are mentioned. Anyone who has played some kind of modern fantasy game has undoubtedly either played as a goblin or come across them in some capacity, goblin merchants being amongst my favourite and some of the most popular. If you are someone who plays a bunch of multiplayer games, then you may have come across the term loot goblin, which is essentially when a cretinous individual decides they want all the loot just because they're a real life goblin. So if you are to take one thing away from this video, then let that be, don't be a loot goblin unless you plan on giving it all to me, because in that case, give me all the treasure. I'm not a goblin in disguise, I promise. Why would I make a video exposing my fellow brethren if I was one? Ha <laughs> ha, clever, then we take all of their gold. Be quiet, you idiot. If they find out, we'll get no gold. Do you want no gold? I want gold. Nowadays, we don't really see a great deal of friendly or helpful goblins. They tend to border on neutral characters driven by gold or as some kind of angry horde of henchmen before you meet the real villain. 
Goblins outside of Redcaps aren't incredibly strong creatures, which is why in so many stories they're often seen in large groups, making them much more formidable. And it's also why players will encounter them early on in a game before they themselves have accumulated much power. If by chance you've wanted to play a game where the protagonist is a goblin, then I'd highly recommend Styx Master of Shadows. I really enjoyed it, and Styx is a very funny and likeable character. To summarise, goblins are pretty complicated creatures, despite how stupid they may appear at times. They can be pretty harmless house spirits that for some reason just want to do chores and eat food. They can be little tricksters who get a rise out of annoying people, or they can be murderous creatures who wash their hats in the blood of those they kill. I was about to say that they come in all shapes and sizes, but they are mostly just very small creatures that dwell in dark places. I personally really like goblins because they're a good source of comic relief in most stories, and they also fit into most stories pretty easily, providing a pretty good balance somewhere in between good and evil. If you have any thoughts on anything we've discussed today, or maybe you'd just like to share your favourite goblin characters with me, then please do so in the comments below. As always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained, reminding you to send me all of your treasure. I want to bathe in mountains of gold. I'm not a goblin, by the way. <laughs> gold. What did I say about keeping quiet? I like gold. <laughs> what gold? There is no gold. As usual, you've ruined the entire. Stop rubbing your grub little goblin hands together. There is no gold. The entire point of this video was to trick people into thinking that we're not goblins, so they give us the gold. But as usual, you couldn't keep your mouth shut for 20 minutes and you've ruined it all. Go do the dishes and get in your cage. No! Get in your cage. No! I hate goblins.